So we could go on and on. We talked about Pablo Picasso's Guernica as uh, complementing scholastic studies of the Spanish Civil War. We talked about Bob Dylan's lyrics to Bob Dylan's uh, Blowing in the Wind, complementing scholastic studies on the Civil Rights Revolution. If you want a wonderful book that complements Durkheim and Fromm's um, scholastic inclusions, then go to this John Updike's Rabbit Redux. Have any of you ever read that? I read the first one. Rabbit Run. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Have you ever read that? No. Well, you got a long trip coming up. Why don't you read that book? It's on not the that book? very long either. It's just a couple hundred pages. Rabbit Redux. That's the sequel, right? Well, there's four of them. <coughs> Rabbit <coughs> Redux <coughs> came after Rabbit Run. Updike? Yeah, I'll write it on the board. Are you going to talk about Saul Bellow? Not today, but if you ask me some, he doesn't. The point is that he's not talking about this. Mm -hmm. So, I, but if you want to ask me questions, I'll be happy to do it. The author is John Updike, who's won the Nobel Prize in literature, literature, and I suppose his most famous books were the Rabbit Tetralogy. Four of them. Well, I'm talking today about Rabbit Redux, which he re he returns. Means. <clears throat> so when you read when you read this book, you see everything that Durkheim is talking about, everything his Fromm is talking about, but it's done in personal terms, with experiences that we could relate to more directly, and I think more profoundly than just in numbers. What, um, what time frame? It's 1969. That's an excellent question because 1969 may have been the most tumultuous year in our history. Let me tell you about everything that's going on. Um, every major city has uh, race riots. For some reason, Mobile didn't. I don't exactly know exactly why, but every major city in this country had very violent race riots. The women's liberation movement, the counterculture and drugs, students occupying college campuses in opposition to the Vietnam War. 1969 was the moon landing. All of these things are taking place at the same time. Life clearly is changing. For Americans. And in this guy's life, things are changing. The, the name of the character is Harry Angstrom, and his nickname is Rabbit. He was a star basketball player in high school, so he got that nickname Rabbit because he could run very fast. Harry Angstrom. What is the what is the malaise that his name implies? Really? Angst? Yeah. Um, so look that up, tell me what it said. Look it up on your phone and tell me what the definition of angst is. Because Updike chose this very carefully. It's fear based. Um, well look it up. Tell me what it says. Sure. Angst is actually a German word, it means fear, but um, if feeling of deep anxiety or dread, typically sure. an unfocused one about the human condition or the state of the world in general. Sure. Unfocused. That's, mm -hmm. See, that's exactly what you were talking about. So in the midst of all of these social, political, and economic, and technological changes taking place in the United States, here's what's happening to him in 1969. His wife has run away with one of his friends. She's living and having sex with one of his friends. Wait, this is in the sequel? This is in the sequel. Okay. The Rabbit okay. Redux. He loses his job to uh, automation. He's a, he's a uh, printer. And the old time printers had to single handedly take letters and put them down. This is an automated process. It's called linotype, if you're interested. His home is burnt down by arsonists. And he's 
he's forfeiting the respect of his young son. So if you're looking for somebody who's confused, suffering from angst, it's rabbit angstrom in rabbit redux. And he becomes just like uh, Frome and uh, Durkheim for Dex. He becomes this normless anomic. That's somebody who suffers from anomie. It's called an anomic, A-N-O-M-I-C. Every night he has, an, he admits he has this nightmare. This is it, I quoted it. He's floating on a parabolic curve, trying to steer on it. Though the thing he was trying to steer was fighting him like a broken sled. The guy is just aimless. He's just to continue to use the uh, the ship metaphor. He's unmoored again with no oars and with no rudder. He's being taken places without his control. So in his confusion, he makes some uh, terribly self-destructive decisions. He goes to a bar. This is a middle-class guy living amidst this tumult in a tumultuous age. He goes to a bar and he meets an 18-year-old girl. They have a conversation. It turns out she comes from a very affluent family in the New York suburb in Connecticut. And he takes her home to live with him, out of nowhere. What well, happened, I mean, you know? Within a day, her pimp drops in, and it's clear he's not leaving. And she wants him to stay there because he's shooting her up with heroin. In one day, this guy's life has changed. The pimp calls himself Skeeter. He's, on the, he's running away, just the girl's running away from her family for reasons that are unclear. Her parents apparently had a divorce and she didn't like the uh, stepfather. This guy's on the run from the cops. He's, uh, he, he jumped bail on a drug charge, Skeeter. And he's the prototypical uh, demagogue. He calls himself the, that's what it italics, black Jesus. And instead of bemoaning confusion, he says, quote, confusion is God's very face. And there's no salvation except through me. Sound familiar? So Skeeter agitates for the murderous overthrow of the white controlled status quo in favor of a tyrannical black regime that he personally would control. He takes advantage of this young girl in Rabbit's house through degrading sex acts and providing, either providing or withholding the narcotics she craves. Among the techniques he uses to take advantage of Rabbit is called mow mowing the flak patches. Have you ever heard that term? No. Have you ever heard of the Mau Mau's? I have not. This was a violent um, black terrorist group fighting um, British imperialism in Africa in the 1950s and 60s. Their leader was Como Kenyatta. Do you remember that name? <clears throat> Were they like all over Africa or just in certain countries? Kenya. Kenya? That's, he changed his name to Kenyatta, meaning uh, the ruler of Kenya. Yeah. Yeah. What is Kenya called today? Look it up. See, I, mean, I don't think Kenya is still called Kenya anymore. That's Kenya. It's, it's still, still called Kenya. Kenya. It still yeah. is? You're thinking of Congo, maybe? Other things were going on in the Congo, but they didn't have these violent uh, terrorists trying to destroy British imperialism. So what is Mau Mau? It was, this, this was invented by the famous uh, 
the famous journalist Tom Wolfe. Have you ever read anything by Tom Wolfe? He's amazing. The book he wrote where this term is invented is called Radical Chic. And he described how these Black Panthers would go into the homes of these multi-billionaires and, con and convince them that they were re personally responsible for every um, racist act committed in American history since the times of slavery. And these people would feel so guilt-ridden that they give them millions of dollars to the Black Panthers who vowed to murder all these people at one time or another. So Mau Mauing means terrorism, and a flat catcher is somebody who uh, is a masochist, who loves to get hurt, and clearly are going to be being hurt by this. Did Tom Wolf write books or articles? What kind of was he? You said Radical he Chic is the. It's called Radical Chic and Mao Maoing the Flat Catches. He also wrote. Look him up. Look at the great books he's he's written. So many great books. Name some others. Check it out on your phone. He's a remarkable writer. He's the guy that walks around with a white suit oh. and white shoes and. The Bonfire of the Vanities. Yeah. What else? Heard of that. Um, uh, uh, the Right Stuff. Yep. That's about the astronauts. I've not heard of the electric Kool-Aid acid. I don't know. That's that guy who went around the country in a uh, hippie van. Check him out. He's amazing. Read this book. It's It's tremendous. Is he still alive? He's still alive. I think he's in his 80s or 90s now. 86. 86. <laughs> what are some of the others? Um, let's see. A Man in Full. I don't, um, the Kingdom of Speech. Radical Sheik. Yeah. And, um, I, let's see, this is, I am... Charlotte Simmons, uh, the candy-colored uh, tangerine flake. That's about the race cars in the 1950s, yeah. Anyway, try this radical chic in Mount Mountain, the fly catchers. It's amazing. It takes you back to an old era. So in the confusion, Rabbit's life has become defined by contradictions. He once was confident by Eisenhower era norms. You know, it was the happy days, remember? The most difficult thing facing those kids during the uh, 1950s was which flavor shape they should get at the mold shop, remember that? He realizes that these norms are being discredited in 1969, but he doesn't know what to replace them with. On the one hand, he loathes uh, Skeeter for the nonsense he teaches, as well as for the violence and criminality he represents. But at the same time, he admires Skeeter because alone among all Americans, seemingly, he's the only one that believes in himself and holds on, to, holds on tightly to a strong set of values, a strong set of values, no matter how outrageous they are. Well, in short order, all hell breaks loose. Neighborhood boys spy upon Skeeter while he's raping the girl. It's not by accident that he opens the blinds. He wants the whole neighborhood to see this. Now, this is an all-white neighborhood. So these boys report back to their fathers who uh, react by burning down Rabbit's house. Skeeter escapes, but he leaves the girl to uh, burn to death in the house. So what's the girl a metaphor for? 
she's just another one of these confused people. I mean, what is she doing? I mean, okay. what, what is she doing in a rural Pennsylvania? This, this takes place in rural Pennsylvania. How did she get there from, from an affluent Connecticut city? With an African, affluent family? What is she doing being a prostitute? By the way, she's driving a Porsche. Remember, this is 1969. That she sells, I think, for a hundred dollars to get more drugs from Skeeter. I mean, these people are just gone. Unmoored, isn't that a great name? They're angry, they're confused, but they're not exactly, they don't exactly know. We can sit here and explain it. And novelists don't explain, they portray. The explaining is done by uh, Durkheim and Fromm. But Updike portrays it. And he does an amazing job. So none of this stuff, as you so correctly pointed out, is, is, can be rationally explained. <clears throat> You're just dealing with three-dimensional people. Human beings are very sensitive beings. Uh, you know, the examples I use are, um, and when you deal with human beings as if they're figures, you, you lose all sense of this. You move into a new house, and one of the things that bothers you about the new house is that they have beautiful roses in the backyard. So one of the things you promise yourself is that as soon as I get settled, and move in everything on the inside, I'm going to replant those roses to the front. I'd like to see the whole neighborhood see how beautiful they are. Roses are organic things, just like we are. If you just dig a hole and plop the, dig a hole in the back, pull them out willy-nilly, dig a hole in the front, plop them in, the roses will be dead by uh, Tuesday. You have to dig this hole around the roses in the back, Yards in circumference, more than the roots. You have to do the same thing in the front. You have to fertilize the front. You have to water it continuously. You have to take great care if you want an organic thing to stay alive. Another example I give is, um, have any of you ever had goldfish or tropical fish? Yeah. I mean, you go to, the, you go to a pet store. You've established your fish tank, and the pH, the balance between acid and, and, and base is never the same in any body of water. So again, sensitive organic creatures, whether they're human beings or goldfish or guppies or whatever they are, have a hard time adjusting to different pH balances in water. So you pay a lot of money at a, at a pet store for these new fish. You can't just drop them into your tank. You have to take the plastic bag that they come in, knock some holes in them, place the plastic bag in your tank, and slowly but surely let the water somehow coalesce until finally the fish have had an adequate amount of time to adjust. And then you dump them in. If you don't take the time, and care, and effort to do that with organic creatures like goldfish, guppies, rose bushes, and human beings, we die. I've, I've had bad fish experience. Uh, I haven't had good local fish. Is it freshwater or...? or uh... Fresh. So I, I got a goldfish and then I died, and then I got another goldfish. And then I, I won a, uh, I won a beta fish at a, at a fair or something like that. It's a fighting fish. Mm -hmm. And I knew that you couldn't put two beta fish together because they'd kill each other. That's right. But I thought, uh, you know, the goldfish and the beta fish would be okay together. But the uh, apparently the beta fish kills the goldfish and decapitates it, so uh, it wasn't it wasn't a good <laughs> wasn't a good day. <laughs> a good day for the fish. So. Well, for one of the fish, you mean? Yeah. <laughs>
So, on the one hand, rabbit is repelled by Skeeter's cowardice. He just let this girl burn to death. But he, he takes Skeeter in his car. Remember, the Porsche has been sold for $100. And he uh, helps him escape the cops who are looking for him for two reasons, both to jail him for jumping bail on the drug charge, but also they want to question him about this uh, arson. He didn't do it. But they want to know what his role was in it, if any. How do you explain this? Well, the, the demagogue bends rabbit to his will. That's what these uh, demagogues are, very willful, skillful, and they're very skillful at it, bending people to their will. They have charisma. They're very shrewd. There's a magnetic attraction about them, and I'm telling you what it is. While everyone else is confused, they're serene, or they appear to be serene. While everyone else doesn't know what's up and what's down, they're sure of what's up and what's down, what's east and what's west. And these demagogues under difficult times are, are impossible for most people to resist. Look at this, again, Al Quinones. The man says, can I ask you who you voted for? He says, Donald Trump. I mean, how? So I want you to, I want you to always remember that, uh, Jennifer, when you, when you become a professor or a practicing psychologist that the uh, statistics are important, but they don't begin to tell us about how complex our lives are. More um, is in psychology, you're not looking at a broad, you're a lot of times looking at one set of people or even one person. And then, you know, trying to, you know, come to terms with the fact that you need, you know, numerical or empirical data to support that person's experiences. You know, the danger of that is what's called positivism. Uh, Have you ever heard that term before? Yes. It seems to be a running theme. That only... Truth can only come from uh, statistics. Now questions come up about um, people ask questions about well, where's the humanity in this, where's the justice, where's the decency in this. And um, you don't have to be a genius to know that justice doesn't lend itself to a statistical analysis. Decency doesn't lend itself to a statistical analysis. Honorableness. So the positivists conclude that since justice doesn't lend itself to a statistical analysis, the question of justice is simply a nonsensical question because it can't be answered statistically. And they, the positivists therefore become relativists since it can't be asked, answered statistically, justice and decency, what's an honorable person, what's a decent person, then those are nonsensical issues. What traditionalists do is they say, tell me what question you want to answer, and then we'll come up with a method that's appropriate for answering it. So, for example, if I, if I say, how tall is your daughter? I wouldn't go to a philosophical treatise or a book of the Bible to answer that question. I would take a ruler, a measuring stick, have a stand against the wall and measure her. <clears throat> if 
I want to know um, what percentage of white women voted for Donald Trump, the most misogynist president we've ever had. Again, the Bible and the uh, you know, philosophical treatises are going to help me on this. What, but what percentage, percentage was it? 51? 52 percent of the white women voted for Donald Trump. Too many. Isn't that amazing? Or hmm. well, if you wanted to know why they would vote for Donald Trump, you're not going to find that through statistics. And now all of a sudden it becomes nonsensical. So what the positives do, and what you have to be careful about, is they have only one method of analysis. And any subject or issue or question that doesn't fit that method of analysis all of a sudden becomes irrelevant and inappropriate. Instead of taking the traditional route, the Aristotelian route, tell me what the question is and then I'll, find, I'll try to come up with a method to deal with that question. They use the opposite approach. Only one method is appropriate. Any question that can't be answered that way 